This video has been made with the purpose of education and awareness of real crimes and there is no disrespect intended to anyone. This is to help promote truth and justice for anyone who has been a victim of crime. What I'm about to report is what I have researched online and I will welcome any corrections should they be required. Hey there little berries and new breeze, it's Eri Berry here. I hope you are keeping cool in the heat. I for one hate the summer. Unpopular opinion, I know, but it's my opinion, it's my feelings, it's my life, and I hate the summer. I hate the heat. I am a winter baby through and through. Now, keeping cool in the summer is it, like an uphill struggle for me. And uh, so what I do is certain things is uh, take these uh, like neck cooling tubes, put them in the freezer, then put them around your neck and they feel really good. Uh, do what I did last year and put some hot water bottles in the freezer and hug them and they keep you nice and cool. Um, putting your um, feet into cool uh, bowls of water, that will keep you nice and cool. And of course the obligatory ice cold drink. I do have a small fan going at the moment. Um, hopefully it won't get picked up on the mic and I apologise if it does. I think last year the audio was a little bit different. I mean, you couldn't quite hear the fan, but you could definitely hear it was almost like an echo. Uh, but I'm going to try and minimise that this year. So in this particular case, we are going to go to California and particularly Orange County in California. I will give a major trigger warning at the beginning. This case has heavy themes of domestic violence, domestic abuse, gaslighting, manipulation. It is very heavy with that subject matter. So if this is not something that, uh, that you'd be comfortable watching, if it's triggering to you and you don't want to watch any further, I will completely understand. We're going to be focusing on a lady called Zazelle Dominique Preston, who went by ZZ as a nickname. She was one of five children. She had two sisters and two brothers. She was born on the 5th of September in 1985 in Orange County, California. Throughout her life, she lived with many members of her family, including her siblings, aunties, uncles, mum, and everybody. They were all very, very close. And uh, she had a huge passion and talent for both art and dance. I'm not sure which one she was going to opt as a career. Some I've seen said that she was a very talented ballerina, so she may have gone on to dance school or possibly even art school. She may have gone to college and got a degree in fine art or something like that. She was popular. She was loud, vivacious, bubbly, and she loved fashion as well. Pink was her favourite colour. She she, you know, when she looked at the camera, you could tell she was a very, very attractive person. So she was very much into her makeup, into her fashion. ZZ met her first love at high school. I couldn't find what his name was. But at the age of 17, she discovered that she was pregnant. And this meant that her dreams of, you know, becoming a dancer or becoming an artist or maybe even doing both had to be pushed back. The priority now was her child, and in 2002, she welcomed a little girl into the world. Some sources I've read and heard say that she stayed with her boyfriend for the next uh, six years, and some say that they didn't stay together for very long, but Zazel did actually go on to have a second daughter in 2008. Not long after giving birth to her second daughter, ZZ was on her own. I mean, she she took modeling jobs because of the fact that, you know, she was a very attractive person and she was a talented dancer, meant that she could, you know, modeling was a really, really good way of, you know, getting some money for herself and for her daughters. She was also very fun loving and loved to go out with her girlfriends. And when she was 23 in 2008, she met and fell in love with 27 year old William Wallace. They fell deeply in love. They fell hard for each other. They were good looking. They fancied the pants off each other. It was a fiery and passionate relationship. And ZZ, of course, wanted a decent stepfather for her two daughters. And this man just seemed to just treat her like royalty. He was amazing. But when she introduced him to her family, they felt he was a bit off. Wallace was high maintenance. He demanded that ZZ spent most of her free time with him. If she wanted to make herself up, it shouldn't be for any other reason than for him. 
She shouldn't have to go out and have fun. She shouldn't have to go out and have friends and go out to work and do anything other than be with him because he genuinely felt that he was her world, even though she's the one that should decide that. Now, Zizi was pretty much obsessed with Wallace but she did want her freedom too. She had things in her life that she wanted to pursue, but Wallace was so manipulative and so persuasive that even when he actually was unfaithful to her, he did cheat on her throughout their relationship, he somehow managed to convince Azelle that it was the other women's fault. That it wasn't his fault that other women found him attractive. Hmm. So he was possessive and he was also jealous. He would send her horrible texts if she was away from home any longer than he felt was necessary, even if she went to see her mum. Yet he was the one who was being unfaithful repeatedly. Yet Sazel brought him back every time. The texts became vitriolic and soon became, you know, fiery verbally and then it progressed to physical abuse. Wallace beat Zizi up several times and her family tried to persuade Zizi to leave him. You know, he, he was no good for her. They didn't like him. He was injuring their daughter. He was, he was causing harm to her and therefore her girls. But Zizi, she just loved her him so much and after a couple of years together they actually made it official and got married yet Wallace he actually beat up his wife at their wedding reception really beat her severely and he didn't just punch and kick her you know anywhere in the body he focused on her head and he caused her to black out their altercations became quite well known in their neighborhood as well. They were living together at this point. The neighbors saw them and heard them arguing a lot, but like a lot of neighbors, they felt it was really none of their business. And even if they did try and intervene, Wallace would just say to them, look, it's none of your business, keep out of it. Zazelle sometimes went to her neighbors for help. And occasionally she did run out of the house. On one occasion, she was actually found wandering the neighborhood in a kind of semi-concussed state. She'd been punched out by Wallace and she didn't quite know where she was. Zizi's grandmother also reported to have received a phone call from Zazelle when she was cowering in a convenience store bathroom, hiding from Wallace, begging her grandmother to come and get her. These physical fights became so bad that Zazelle had to do something she filed charges against Wallace and he actually went to jail. Now, before Wallace and Zizi got together, Wallace had actually previously been in trouble for assaulting one of his previous partners. So this was a pattern with him. And that's what happens in domestic violence. I really hate when people say, just leave. You have no right to say that to a victim when you've never been in their position. I'm not saying that victims should stay, but I'm saying it is a lot harder than people think it is to leave a domestically violent relationship. In many cases, it's financial. In some cases, it's physical. I've heard people who have had their shoes taken away from them or physically being locked into the house. Partners will cut them off from their family, even badmouth them to their own family so that the family turn their back on them or they will try and rein in their partner to make them feel as if other people are out to get them and they need to remain strong as a unit. At this point, they're usually living together financially and everything dependent on one another. They often have kids together, are married, they have joint assets. I've never been in a domestically violent relationship before. I would recommend you watch the uh, Real Stories uh, episode called Behind Closed Doors. There is something that one of the victims said at the end of that episode that really rang true with me. She said that now that she's moved on press charges and her husband is now in jail, she's going to move on, she's going to take care of all of their joint assets and she's going to get on with her life. She said the main thing is she now has to mourn 
and grieve for the man she fell in love with. Now that sounds very strange, but have you ever been in a relationship, not, not necessarily a violent or manipulative one, where, but where the person turns out to not be the same person with whom you fell in love? They either changed or they showed you their true colors. They either morph into a completely different personality or they affect a personality at the beginning and then start morphing into their true selves. Now, before I was with my wife, I was in a relationship with a woman who I felt at the time was the one. And after almost a year, I felt that she wasn't the same person I got with. And after we broke up, we tried to be friends. But even though the dynamic of our relationship had changed, I noticed that she was just not the same person. And I, I described it once as, it's almost as if the woman with whom, with whom I fell in love was dead. And her body has been possessed by a completely different entity. It's as if she's had a complete personality shift. She's not the same person. Some of her mannerisms are the same, the way she talks, the way she walks. All those things are kind of the same, but the just her responses and the way she treats people, it's difficult to explain. But that's what happens in domestically violent relationships. It doesn't start violent. It starts the absolute opposite. It starts out wonderful the victim falls so head over heels in love with the other half and that's the person they fall in love with and gradually gradually bit by bit drip by drip over a period of time the violent partner changes into their true selves but the victim still loves the person as they presented themselves at the beginning of the relationship and they hold on to that because every so often that personality will come back in and they believe that that personality is the real them and that if the victim changes and does things the way the partner wants, that original person will come back. It doesn't happen like that. And it's difficult for people to get their head around that personality, you can fall in love with a personality, but not necessarily the real person. Um, if you ever watch the another real stories called um, the girl who became three boys that's also a very powerful one too where a girl affected three male personalities and got two of her friends to fall in love with her as those two of those three personalities and one of them called Jess she said that in her head and in her heart the boy who a friend had affected as a personality was real but she knew also that he wasn't real and she has to come to the terms of the fact that he's not coming back, he's not real, he never was. But that's difficult to understand. I suppose that's sometimes why people who, whose family members, friends or anyone close to them gets accused and convicted of a heinous crime and they're like, I never ever would have thought they'd done that. Because people are like mirror balls. They are one ball but each piece of mirror is a different facet. And sometimes those facets can be obscured. We don't see them, but when we do see them, we deny they're there and we see the brightness rather than the darkness. But either way, we're, we're going into different territory, but this is kind of similar to what Cezelle was feeling about her husband. But as the beginning of 2011 crept round and they got married, he went to jail a couple of times during their relationship. Zazel found out that she was expecting William's baby. When Wallace was in prison, she did visit him, even though she got a restraining order against him and he convinced her to drop the restraining order. He got his claws into her again, promising he'd change because he found Jesus. This is really frustrating, particularly for Zizi's family because they genuinely believed that Zazel was going to be free of this man that finally he was in jail, there was a restraining order, she could put distance between them, she could divorce him, but when she found out she was pregnant, that would tie them together for life. Yes, you can have a separate relationship to your ex-partner, you can both be parents to the kid. However, if one of the partners is violent, I think that that should be a supervised visit at the most. But I'm not sure what they were going to do. 
when Wallace got out of jail, ZZ put up a post saying that she couldn't wait to have her sexy ass husband back. And there were pictures that she put of them online, like embracing her, sitting on their, on his lap. And another one with them kissing, saying, lovebirds for life. Now, I don't doubt that she absolutely adored Wallace and wanted to be with him forever. But I think she wanted to be with a man that she believed him to truly be underneath it all. But the violence aside that you know that they could work on that and put the violence to one side but actually no it was the other way around the violent side was the real wallace after several months and don't forget zz was pregnant at this time wallace didn't change he continued to beat his pregnant wife at one point when she was quite heavily pregnant her grandmother found Zazel curled up in the fetal position outside their home, all bloody from a beating from Wallace. Over the last half of her pregnancy, from around July to October, Zazel's posts on Facebook became very irregular and inconsistent and sometimes very loving about her husband. And some of them were, she would say things like, God, please help me. Or she even posted that at one point that she wanted to commit suicide and that she wasn't joking. Her family had to jump in and help her. ZZ began to confide in several people and she, she let them know she wasn't happy, that her husband was not showing any sign of change. And the fact that she was pregnant and he was beating her still, he had no regard for his unborn child either. It wasn't good for her children. So... She decided once and for all that she would take control of her life and she decided on a different career path. So ZZ enrolled in college to study to become a domestic violence counsellor. When I was researching this case, I did watch some other true crime YouTubers videos on this. And there is a YouTuber called Jaina Lynette. I believe that's how I'm pronouncing her name correctly. I do apologize if I'm not. When I watched her video, she said something better than I could have said it but I'm just going to echo what she said because I can't say it any better than she did, is that a domestic violence counsellor, if you, quite often they are victims or they know victims or have had close uh, contact or it's close to home with them, how would you feel if your domestic violence counsellor was still with the violent partner? It's similar to say for example a counsellor for drug alcohol smoking gambling or whatever kind of addiction or or whichever we're still doing drugs or drinking or smoking even if they're preaching the complete opposite with zazel would have been brilliant as a domestic violence counsellor she had lived it her course leader later said that zazel was planning to leave her husband and becoming a domestic violence counsellor was likely her first step on that path she was going to become an independent person i don't think wallace liked that but she was pregnant and she needed to make sure she could have her baby and be strong enough and eventually leave him wallace was such a brute that when zazel was seven and a half months pregnant he punched her pregnant belly sending her into early labor she gave birth to a baby boy who was thankfully healthy in the middle of October 2011. Over the next few weeks, Zazel juggled being a new mother and her coursework. She was studying hard. Wallace wasn't liking it, but Christmas was coming up and Zizi having now three children, Christmas was meant to be a magical time. So she put up the tree, she wrapped her daughter's presents and they were aged eight and three at the time. And they would have been very, very excited indeed. On Christmas Eve, um, Zizi and Wallace went to a relative's home and they got very drunk. They left the party relatively early and people at the party said that they seemed to be okay. They hadn't argued or anything. But when they arrived home, they went into a very drunken fight. One of the neighbors reported hearing uh, banging about in the, in the house and, and yelling and screaming. And at one point, Wallace went outside and Zizi was trying to run away and he literally dragged her back in. But even that wasn't enough. 
for the neighbours to call the police because this was just a repeat performance of what they'd seen before. The next morning, Christmas morning, Wallace went to his stepdaughters and told them to go into the living room where they began to open up their Christmas presents and their mother was on the sofa watching them. Zizi was wearing sunglasses, which is a bit strange for winter time and indoors. But when the eight-year-old asked Wallace what's wrong with mummy, he said to her, mummy got drunk and ruined Christmas. Right. The eldest daughter was so excited by the presents she got, whether it was sweets, clothes, toys, whatever, she ran to her mother and went to give her mother a hug, but her mother didn't reciprocate. The girl went on to say that when she hugged her mother, she was very cold and very stiff. She didn't feel right. It was almost like hugging a statue, a cold statue. Later that morning, 911 received a call from William Wallace at about half nine Christmas morning. And he said, my wife needs medical attention. When emergency services arrived, they saw that Sazelle was very clearly deceased. They saw she had a number of injuries on her, several lacerations and blunt force trauma to the head, it seemed to be. And she'd been dead for quite some time. William said that the night before when they got very drunk, Zazel and he had a back and forth. They were arguing and fighting with each other. And in her drunken state, she fell into a glass table, shattering it. He took her to bed, got the glass out of her. And she went downstairs in the morning and sat on the sofa, put the sunglasses on, probably because she had a headache. But she must have just passed away there on the sofa. No. Zazel had more than fallen into a glass table. The police could tell that she had received a brutal beating and it was clear that she had been dragged. There were drag marks outside. There were contusions on her legs, which showed the dragging that had taken place. Yes, there was glass around the place and there were, there were glass fragments in her but this was more than that. And there was blood all over the, the whole apartment. It had some of it had been cleaned, I believe, but not all of it. There were holes in the wall that had been punched very, very recently. And Wallace had already been in jail a couple of times for assaulting Suzelle. And it's also clear that she had died way before. So he had propped up his wife's lifeless lifeless body after murdering her put glasses on her and made her daughters believe that mum was alive and well and looking on but drunk and blamed her for ruining christmas the police didn't believe him of course i don't think anybody would he was arrested it took nine years so almost a decade for this case to go to trial and Wallace was not allowed out on bail. He spent all this time on remand. There have been much speculation about why it was put forward that many times. Now, this was at the beginning of 2012. And it was in 2011 that the case finally came to court. Personally, I believe one of the reasons for that was because Sazelle's eight-year-old was now 18. And she could give a full account as to what actually happened that night and they probably wanted to wait until she was of legal age or at least old enough to be able to articulate and explain to have gone through the process of having to cope with what happened to her before she actually testified maybe the three-year-old girl could have but she would have been so young at the time Sazelle's eldest daughter said that the night that they came home from the New Year's Eve party, her mother and stepfather did have an argument back and forth, and Zazelle did indeed fall onto a coffee table. And Wallace asked his eight-year-old stepdaughter to help take her mother upstairs to the bathroom, 
and then into the bed to lay her down in the bed and he asked her to pick the shards of glass out of her wounds. I believe Cezelle was still alive here but she had already received several beatings. Cezelle's daughter did say that when they were carrying her to the bathroom Wallace accidentally dropped her and Zazel hit her head on the toilet very, very hard, really hard, because you can imagine that the toilet is a big, like, ceramic, um, solid structure that hitting your head on it would cause a lot of damage. Zazel's daughter believes that that was the fatal blow, but she couldn't be sure. But what is certain is that Wallace knew that his wife's injuries were horrific and he did not call for help. It's not clear as well whether Zazel fell into the coffee table or was pushed but she did receive a beating from Wallace, which contributed to her death. So for that reason, Wallace was found guilty of second degree murder. He was sentenced to 15 years to life. He was given credit for the nine years he'd already spent. Now, what annoys me is that he still pled not guilty, even though he clearly was guilty. And his lawyer was saying things like, you're going to hear about a lot of abuse, but there was also a lot of love. And this was not his fault. It was just an accident. No. If someone falls into a coffee table and they get shards of glass on them, you call for emergency services. You don't just pop them in the bed and hope they sleep it off. It doesn't work like that. And if you find that they're deceased in the morning, you don't prop them up on the sofa with sunglasses, making out they're still alive. <sighs> Seriously, this, this guy... I hope he never gets out. He's a danger to everybody. And I feel so sorry for those three kids. Yeah, the, the boy that um, Suzelle had, he was only seven weeks old. He wouldn't remember this, but he would know now what happened when he just was just born. He never got the chance to know his mother, really. But I'm sure he, he knew that his mother would have adored him, absolutely adored him. And those two girls, I believe the, the girls and uh, the boy were raised by Suzelle's mother after this. But yeah, Cezelle was only 26, and um, I believe she would have made an amazing domestic violence counsellor. And uh, her smile and her lively personality, she reminds me of Marie Joseph, who I covered in a previous uh, case, who was just so bubbly and full of life and uh, loved to sing and dance and, and uh, all smiles. And I believe that her kids will definitely be making their mother proud. But um, yeah, that's that's this case for this fortnight. And I hope that everyone out there stays safe, stays cool. And uh, I will also like to give shout outs to my members, Denty and Shaz, Alf, Checking Convictions and Candy Ray. Thank you very, very much. I absolutely love you all. And I would appreciate it if you would consider joining the channel. And then I, every time I get a new member, I put a new tree in the little Airy Berry Orchard. And every time I get a subscriber, I put another berry on the berry vine. So I'm hoping to get a nice full vine and a full orchard. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very, very much for watching, guys. I love you all. And um, I will speak to you soon. Bye.